Hello, my name is Julie Kaplan, and I'm the manager of public programs at the Center for Jewish History. I'm happy to welcome you today to our virtual space to the fourth program in our Family Affairs series. The Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions, which together create the largest and most comprehensive archive of the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. The Family Affairs series features scholars who at different points in their careers decided to turn to their personal history and the findings and questions these stories inspire. The series is curated by Dr. Natalia Alexion, who has been moderating all the conversations this academic year. We have one more program scheduled for May 26th, and we hope you'll join us. Before I pass her the virtual mic, let me briefly introduce our speakers. Natalia Alexion is Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Graduate School of Jewish Studies, Turo College, New York. Her research interests developed around the Holocaust, Polish and Jewish history and historiography, gender studies and beyond. She published Where To? The Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944 to 1950, and co-edited two volumes of Pauline, examining Holocaust memory and Jewish historiography. She has recently published a critical edition of The Destruction of Juki of Jews by Gershon Tafet. Her book, Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust, which we celebrated here last September, is about to be released by Littman Library of Jewish Civilization. Last fall, she was a Gerda Henkel Fellow at Imre Kertesz Kolleg in Jena, Germany, completing a book on Jewish medical students in East Central Europe. She is also co-editor in chief of the journal East European Jewish Affairs. Susan Jacobowitz is a professor of English at Queensborough Community College, part of the City University of New York. Research areas include second generation experience, graphic depictions of war, and the conflicts and challenges of post-war Jewish identity. Her scholarship has been published in academic journals and edited collections, and in 2019, she received a fellowship from the Mellon Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies to complete a manuscript about her father and her own second generation identity entitled Far From Childhood, a Holocaust memoir, which we're discussing today. Bernice Lerner is a senior scholar at Boston University Center for Character and Social Responsibility. She is the author of The Triumph of Wounded Souls, Seven Holocaust Survivors' Lives, and co-author of Happiness and Virtue Beyond East and West, Toward a New Global Responsibility. Today, we're discussing her new book, All the Horrors of War, a Jewish Girl, a British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen Belsen, in which she focuses on the life of her mother, Rachel Ginuth. Before we start, I have two technical notes. First, you're welcome to write down your questions for the Q&A portion of our program. To do so, please use the Q&A function <clears throat> visible on the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions throughout the program. And please note that the chat function has been disabled. Second, the program is being recorded and will be available on the Center's website and YouTube channel soon. We will email you the link to the recording as soon as it's available. And now I turn this over to Natalia. Thank you so much, Julie. And it's, uh, it's an honor and a great pleasure to, to be here today, tonight, where I am today, uh, where uh, my interlocutors are. And uh, it's not been planned this way, but uh, we are going to speak on the um, afternoon leading to uh, Yom Zikaron, uh, the, 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 the day, um, devoted to the memory of, of the Holocaust uh, in, in Israel. And it's, um, it's a wonderful coincidence in a way uh, in timing. Uh, and so let me, let me get uh, started by giving the mic to, uh, to, Bernie, to Bernice and to Susan, who will um, talk uh, about uh, their book and uh, Susan, their forthcoming book. And then we'll uh, have a chance to have a conversation about these uh, wonderful projects. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm so honored to be on with Susan Jacobowitz. We had a lovely conversation a, a bit ago, and um, yeah, we have a lot in common. And um, we were talking before with Natalia, we have very different approaches to telling our stories. So I'll tell you a little bit about my book, and then Susan will tell you about hers. And I'm just going to share my screen now. 
So I wrote a book, I wrote a dual biography uh, about my mom and about the British brigadier, uh, Glenn Hughes, who spearheaded the liberation efforts at Bergen-Belsen. So here is, just to show you briefly, here is a cover of my book, the US edition, All the Horrors of War, and on the right, published simultaneously at the same exact time, I uh, came out exactly one year ago uh, in time for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. A uh, British press published it and they had the same images, the same content of the book, but they, you could see how they the, uh, conceived of the cover very differently in the title. But so I wanna just refer you to the British one because it shows like a full length image of my mom. And um, this is very early after the war, maybe six or seven months after the end of the war. You could see that she already is nourished and dressed. Here she is, she's very sick. She's 15 years old and you can see in her eyes um, a sadness. I, you, this is not um, the picture of you know the happy celebrating survivor after the war. She's orphaned, she has tuberculosis, she's in snowy northwest Sweden in a tuberculosis sanatorium in Arvika. And um, it's really very, she, I think she's quite depressed. And here is a picture of Glenn Hughes and this is on top. He's actually um, in his caravan uh, near Bergen-Belsen, he could be working on uh, masterminding whatever he's doing. Could be he wrote up five different levels of diets to feed starved people. So um, anyway, I had quite the challenge to write this dual biography, as you might imagine. How do you tell the story of two such disparate characters? And they never met each other, even despite the title to meet in hell. So it's because it's a work of nonfiction and it would have been highly unlikely for them to meet given the numbers of people that were in Bergen-Belsen at the time of the liberation. Glenn Hughes came upon 55,000 to 60,000 sick and dying people. My mother was but one of them. Um, she was one of those who were in the two camps. One was the horror camp where things were particularly Dante-esque and that's where she was. So how did I tell the story? So I decided that I would tell it as sort of, I hate to use this word, but it's kind of a thriller, kind of a race against time story because um, how was she rescued? I'm, uh, the question that inspired my research was, how did my mother survive the war? She had spoken to me my whole life about stories of her past, her childhood, her war years, but she could not tell me how precisely she was rescued because at the end of the war, she had fallen unconscious. And so I was really digging deep into the finding out just how she got from this hut that was just a mass of human excreta on the floor of people dying and living in the same space to a clean makeshift hospital room uh, where she was wrapped in, cleaned up and wrapped in a clean blanket. So that was sort of my exploration. That took me to Glenn Hughes, who was most prominently associated with the liberation. So I tried to tell the story. I decided to tell the story as sort of where was he, where was she during the last year of the war? Where did they start out and how did they come to both be in this same hell in Northwest Germany? So I basically the book centers around four seasons, the last year of the war, which was a very dramatic year, spring of 1944 to the spring of 1945. The fifth season talks about the convergence, the liberators coming in, the inmates, and their reaction to the liberation and how, how the rescue, how the British went about the rescue. And it talks about the convergence and through the points of view of these two very different protagonists, right? The rescuer and the one who was saved. The book is sandwiched, these, um, the meat of the book is sandwiched between the prologue and the epilogue, which gave me an opportunity to tell some other very important stories. And also it's sandwiched between a few couple of pages talking about the Belzen trial, the Belzen trial sort of setting the scene for what's to come. And then some really 
fascinating episodes that came out of the Belson trial and what was going on at that time. So this here on the right is a, um, a publication uh, that was published on November 11th, 1945, during the Belson trial, which took place in a makeshift courtroom in Lüneburg. And Glenn Hughes happened to be the first witness. He set the tone for what was the first international war crimes trial that applied international law. And on the bottom right, you see the 45 SS who were being prosecuted. And number nine is the famous Irma Grese, who attracted a lot of attention because she was beautiful and young and very sadistic. So I tell the story, really the meat of the book is their travels and where they were and the various seasons. So just to give you an idea, in the spring of 1944, Glenn Hughes is deputy director of medical services for the British Eighth Corps. He did not know it then, but they were to fight the most vicious uh, Nazi unit, units, the Panzer units, and they would, they would have a very big part in the war. And they were practicing in the Yorkshire Wolds, which was similar in topography to what they would encounter here when they landed in Normandy. So they, this was his role and they were planning for the D-Day invasion. Here was my mom in Sigat in the spring of 1944 on one lovely Passover day, she's sitting together at the Seder table with her family. There's nine people around the table. They're celebrating the holiday. And who could have possibly imagined that one year later, really just one year later, only she and her older sister would be the only ones to survive from that small family unit. There was, there are other things that happened and many other of her relatives died, but that was the story of that Passover. So I'll just give you one other little bit of information, which is on D-Day, which is June 6th, 1944, the most magnificent chapter in the annals of military history when this armada of um, a multinational armada lands on the shores of Normandy. Out and here on June 6th, 1944, my mom was there already for about three weeks. Um, and twice as many people, human beings, were killed in Auschwitz on June 6th as were killed uh, all the allies, uh, of, among all the allied forces as they landed in Normandy. And the, the toll, the death toll at Auschwitz continued for at least a month after every single day whereas it decreased markedly every day as the allies were battling their way up through France and Belgium into Germany. So that's just an interesting fact. So I spent in doing this research, so I told my mom's story and I told the brigadier's story and I juxtaposed them. I had certain hinge points that took people from where the rescuers were to where the, where the victims were. But um, I just, I'm showing you this slide to show you that I was very deep in the archives of, in, in London in reviewing scores and scores of um, Glenn Hughes's written diaries. And I was just very fascinated by him, his handwriting and the kind of human being he was, which, which um, he really was a very standout figure, sort of like an Oscar Schindler in that he remained in contact with uh, survivors for the rest of his life. He was very captivated by um, their story, particularly seeing them recover. Some of them recover after the liberation, not being able to save so many thousands really affected him. And he fast forward went on to become really instrumental in um, the hospice and, and inspiring that hospice movement. Uh, in terms of how people should be treated at the end of their lives. But anyway, he was ex an extremely planful person and he believed in practice, practice, practice. And here you just see up here, um, it's, he's, he writes down the number of casualties on the beaches and how many wounded have to be evacuated on D-Day, D plus one, D plus two, D plus three, all those numbers are, everything centers around D-Day. And he actually arrived on the shores of 
D plus six and the special units and the general hospitals and all, there were just uh, voluminous, voluminous uh, notes uh, in his, in his uh, archives. But I'm just showing this to tell you that here was a person who planned everything out. I mean, every surgery, every medical rescue was down to the second practically. And then he, he came upon Bergen-Belsen. It was just a, a shock. And it was something for which the British Second Army was totally unprepared. At that time, he had been promoted to be Deputy Director of Medical Services for the entire British Second Army. And this was the day um, on April 15th, 1945, when they stepped into Bergen-Belsen. Nothing in the war, nothing he had ever seen anywhere had prepared him for the, had prepared him for this. He was um, a big hero in World War I. He had been on the battlefields. He had seen the bloodiest carnage. And there was nothing, nothing that could have prepared him for what he encountered when he entered Bergen-Belsen on this day in 1945. And so that in a nutshell is a bit about my book. My mom had been in Bergen-Belsen for about a month. She arrived in March of 1945. The norm was death uh, and Frank uh, was died just a couple of weeks before my mom's arrival. And uh, my mom was one of those who easily could have died. She was very much on the borderline. So I'm going to stop my share now and I'm going to turn the floor over to Susan because I want to hear about her book, her book project. Thank you so much, Bernice. I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to do this, that we have a chance to do it together. You know, I'm glad you showed the map because I took the map out. I have so many images that there, I can't possibly go through all of them. So the map showing that area of subcarpatian ruthenia, I think is an important you know, part of the story. And like your story too, it's, this is a really, um, it's a complicated narrative in that uh, to try to tell so many stories at the same time. I wanted to tell the story of my father. I wanted to tell my own story as someone second generation who was sort of trying to figure out you know, where I came from and also do the historical research and the scholarly research with documents and in archives that would explain the story that my father was finally telling me. So I put some images together just to give a sense of what the project is. I spent last year doing a lot of the archival work and writing, so I'm, I'm still finishing the manuscript. But this is my father in Arizona where I grew up. He went to law school in Tucson, Arizona. And so, um, you know, the image of my father transplanted from subcarpatian ruthenia to, to Arizona where he still lives. He's 92 years old and he still lives in Arizona. So he's spent most of his life there actually. It's where the images sort of begin. Um, this is to show that I had um, uh, a fairly all American childhood and upbringing. You can tell by the baseball bat. I was one of three girls raised in Phoenix, Arizona. My parents met in the very small Jewish community in Phoenix um, and were married in 1958. I remained a patriotic child. And we grew up in a suburb, a Christian suburb of Phoenix, where it actually was not very welcoming to people from the outside. About six months before we moved to our neighborhood, a black family that had been living there for six years was burned out on New Year's Eve um, in a sort of violent event that nevertheless, you know, uh, didn't stop my father from, from moving us um, moving us there to go to the public schools, which were supposed to be very good. So there was nothing about us that was different, I think, from our neighbors. We also didn't practice Judaism. We knew that we were Jews, but we didn't practice in any way or go to synagogue. So I think that made me interested in issues of identity as well. And that I, when I was young, I sort of thought that it meant you didn't have a religion to be Jewish because my neighbors were Christian and they did have a religion and they celebrated holidays, but we didn't have any. So. I thought it sort of meant that you didn't have holidays so that you didn't celebrate any particular religion if you were Jewish. So I was kind of a nosy kid and I would go through the closet in my, in the extra bedroom of our house that we called it our study. There was a closet and my parents had things from their past. And there was a little, um, just a very small collection of documents that my father had saved. And one of them was, um, a, you know, an index card from a DP camp in a name that is not his own, which made me think that maybe my father had been a spy. There was a different explanation. 
documents that I couldn't read, you know, like this. This actually turned out to be a, a certification from a mechanics course my father took after the war and he had a driver's license that he was very proud of. And things like this, you know, it, people did know that my dad was Jewish and they did know that he was a Holocaust survivor. When he started his legal practice, there had been something in the local paper and also in the Phoenix Jewish News that sort of identified him in that way. But it wasn't anything that we ever talked about at home or within our family, which makes me feel very nervous talking about it now because it just was something that was very unstated. We didn't ask questions about it. We didn't talk about it. And I think it was very important to just be a typical normal American family. Until this moment, you can see that I had very good hair even then. When I was 24 years old, um, my dad, I was in graduate school and I was working on a project on Eddie Hillison, the Dutch author whose diaries had been published um, in English close to that time. And as I was researching um, the Dutch Jewish experience during World War II, I realized again how much I really wanted to know what had happened to my father. I asked him if he would agree to tell me his story and he said no again. And um, we left it at that, but I wrote him a letter where I asked, you know, I sort of explained to him what it would mean to me. And then when we met again, he said, okay, you can come with me on this trip. So he was planning to take a trip with his cousins in Israel who also survived. Um, they were a brother and a sister. They were all raised together and they were all within a year of age. And they were going to Badkestein where they had been in a, D in, in a DP camp in 1946 and where his cousin Sarah had gotten married. So in 1986, it was her 40th wedding anniversary and she wanted to go back to Badgestein and she wanted my father to join her. And my father said, why don't you come with me? You can talk to my cousins. You can find out something about the past if you're really interested. So Sarah was 16 when she got married and um, to Ben, who was a survivor from Lithuania. My father's in the back wearing um, a military cap that uh, uh, a GI had given him. And Sarah's brother, Moisha, is on the left. And then I had them pose at the same positions um, for me during our trip. And I realized last year when I was working on my manuscript that I was the same age last year, 57, that my father was when we went on this trip together. I had my father stand on the balcony. This was a little photograph we had from his years in the DP camp and in the same position and took a picture. And I think it's here where I think I really felt like the sort of boy and the man start to come together. It always seemed like my father was someone who had had no childhood and no past because we just didn't know anything about it. And here they sort of started to come together. My father agreed to tell me his story while we were on the trip um, with a couple of provisions. He didn't wanna ever talk about it again. He didn't wanna read anything that I would write about it. When I asked my father to tell me his story, I thought it would be pretty straightforward that he would just give me the name of a camp, but it turned out to be very complicated. And it was a sort of you know convoluted odyssey that took him across Europe. Beginning at Auschwitz where he lost his family. So during the, uh, as far as I can tell, they arrived in, on April 16th, 1944. This is where my grandmother and my father's four youngest brothers and sisters um, died. And my father and his father were set apart as depot Jews. They were going to be used for replacements and sent out to other camps. So they were never processed into Auschwitz. They were never give, given tattoos, anything like that. And they were taken to Warsaw where this camp had been established in 1943 to work amongst the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto, but they, the initial prisoners had been worked to death and had died. And so they got an infusion of prisoners from the Hungarian deportations. This was one site, I'm just gonna go quickly and give you a sense of the many sites that were involved in this research. It was evacuated as, as the Russians were approaching. The Russians had liberated Majdanek and it was a sub-satellite camp of Majdanek. So they were marched out in what turned out to be the first death march of the war. They were taken to a place called Kutno and then from there to Dachau. This shows my father's registration at Dachau with his father, um, Jacob, and with his uncle, Moore. There are documents like this that have come from archives that are just so interesting to me. This is a whole sort of little intake thing and a kind of a physical and an interview with my father that he was then forced to sign at the bottom. I've been advised that if the above information should prove false, I will be punished. He's in Dachau in a concentration camp. This is a number on the top left. This is the number that my father remembered from memory and had told me uh, was his number. His uncle and his father, they were all 94, 95, 96 in a series like that. 
Um, it gives the date that he was arrested in June, you know, and it's August when they actually hit Dachau. From the, you can see his name here, his father and, and my father, they were taken to a camp called the Waldlager. It was in Bavaria. It was not far from Munich. It was camouflaged from the top. They were working on a huge bunker project there. When I went there, there's still a little bit of a rune there that you can see. And there are still people who come there and they leave these, you know, light candles and leave these things behind for their loved ones who died at this camp. You'll notice that many of the names are Hungarian because they got this infusion of prisoners from the Hungarian deportations. He was liberated. Uh, he starts to appear on lists like this. He was born in 1929. So he was 15 when he was deported and 16 when he was liberated. And these are in the, the Klausner list, the surviving remnant that went out with names of people who had survived so that relatives could find them. My father's not on this list, but you know, I thought this was kind of interesting because it shows how many people had the name Jakobowicz or Jakubowicz. When I was growing up, I vowed as a child that I would never change my name because I thought we were the only ones. I never met anyone named Jakobowitz. I never met anybody in Arizona who could pronounce it. And I didn't know that there were, that it was such a common Eastern European name or that there were other Jakobowitzes in the world. And so I've come across the records of many, many people with this name. And I followed a paper trail, you know, a paper trail. Um, I was doing research last year at the United Nations archives to look at the UNRWA archives. They ran the camps in Austria where my father spent almost two years. Um, at the top here is my father and his cousins, um, Moisha and Sarah, they're using different names here, but they were all born in 1928 and 1929. My dad's on the far left in this photograph. And his name starts appearing in the lists of these various camps. He's down on the bottom right um, with a name that, you know, it, it says 18, but it's with a felt tip pen. My father lied about his age. He wanted to seem like he was 18 so that he could trade in cigarettes, which were the only thing of value in the camp. So he gave his name, his age as being older. I went through camp reports, you know, I was very interested in the administration of the camps, the challenges that people felt that the DPs were facing. My father was stateless. He was only, you know, he was so young. He was only 16 and 17 years old. This is one of my father's documents from his archive where he, it, it says that he was genuinely born in 1929. So it corrects the birth date. Um, Judith Lukacs was the registrar at the camp where he was staying. And she gives him this document in two languages, just saying, yeah, he really was born in 1929, not 1927. This was so that he could attend a school that they had started um, in, the, in the camp. And here, it, this notation shows it as well. It says the date was mistaken. My father went in and confessed what his real birthday was so that he could attend this little school they had started. And here you can see that she makes a, a notation that corrects, corrects the age here as well. My dad didn't know what would happen. He puts down here that his desired destination is Palestine. He actually wanted to go to the United States, but there was no one to sponsor him. And then the Truman Directive <coughs> made it a possibility. This document I, I was given and it showed his destination was New York. This is the ship manifest and it said USCC, which nobody at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum seemed to know what it um, referred to. Someone suggested Catholic charities but it actually turned out to be the US Committee for the Care of European Children. And that's the way that my father was able to come to the United States. Doing research at EVO, I wanted to see what I could find out about the US Committee for the Care of European Children. The papers are there. And also if I could find some kind of document that would show how my dad actually made this move from Europe to the United States. And um, Gunnar Berg, who is a project archivist at EVO, said that he would check an archive in New Jersey for me. That was the archive of German Jewish Children's Aid. I didn't know that they had been involved in my father's story. I'd only seen a reference to European Jewish Children's Aid, but the two of them merged at some point. So he found a file for my father that had that I don't think anyone had looked at for 69 years that followed him from the DP camps in Europe all the way through foster placements and placement in an orphanage in New York a file that was closed in 1950 when my dad went into the military. His name is at the bottom here. You can see it added in pencil. He became one of the children who was going to leave um, from Austria. 
this is the document that allowed him to leave. He was um, taken to uh, the consulate in Munich where they prepared a certificate of identity in lieu of passport. It was a photograph that I'd never seen of my father as a child. And these I thought were very interesting and I use in my teaching as well. You know, he, he had to sort of, he didn't know English so it was done for him, but my internment was due to racial persecution and not because of any crime. So people who have been in prison or been in camps and that he can't get a, any kind of birth certificate or any documentation. The only documentation we have for my father begins basically with the camps. This is from the, uh, the corporate affidavit. There were 92 children who were sponsored to come over. My father is there, he's 17 years old. And these were the children who were on the, the corporate affidavit. There were 92 of them. Seven months old was the youngest. The oldest were 19, 30 girls and 62 boys. The Jewish Child Care Association of New York was the agency that took over in New York. And, you know, I was able to find um, interviews from the day he arrived. Um, notes, she was communicating with him in Yiddish and they were trying to decide where he would go and what the placement would be. And the reports look like this, you know, typed out, very meticulous, really interesting. And they follow him for several years as he goes to high school. He turned 18. And from 18 to 20, he went to high school. There's a personality picture that's given. I thought this was very moving. He very strongly wanted an education, yet he had feelings of guilt and pain around his dependency and achieving it. He wanted to belong, but as he strove to achieve this, he felt much guilt and degradation in giving up the old ways. Today, while he has achieved much in both areas, he is too close to the painfulness in his experiences to be able to derive deep satisfaction from the present. After his military service, he went to law school in Arizona. And I found this in a newspaper on April 29th, 1955, um, my dad and his team won the moot court competition for the first year of law students um, in 1955. And that date stayed, stayed in my mind because it, my father's on the far right there. Um, but this is the only photograph I've seen of my father as a child that I found during the course of my research. It was taken June 6, 1945, but this is just almost just a month after he was liberated. He was liberated in, on April 29, 1945. So 10 years later, he won moot court. The only, when my father moved into a retirement community a few years ago, I found some personal documents that he had saved. And this shows that at one point in 1960, four days after he became a father for the first time when my older sister was born on the 10th, he received a, a one-time $400 payment as compensation for, for what he endured during the war. My dad often told me um, that he didn't talk about the past because he didn't remember anything from the past. The first time that I went to Ukraine to see where he was born, um, the night before I left, he spent with me and he gave me this map that he had drawn from memory of his town, where his house was, where they were taken when they were deported. And when I went there, this is the only map that I had and it was completely accurate. And I also found a reference to my father's family in, um, in, uh, a, doc in a series of volumes that were prepared in Israel by the Beata Klarsfeld Foundation that used civil records to reconstruct the Jewish community in these areas that were under Hungary's control until the deportation. So this is the, this is the only place where I've ever been able to find a reference to my father's family, including the sister down at the bottom who I was told that I was named after. Um, when I was born. And this is the only picture that we have of my father's mother. It was, um, we don't have any family pictures, so I, I've never seen a picture of his family, but it was taken for, for a, um, a formal document before they were deported. And it was kept by his sister who was living under false papers in Budapest. And she told me that she, she kept it on her at all times in case she was ever taken, she would have this, this photograph of their mother. So that's what my book is about. I think it's also expressing how speechless I, I feel about these two incredible uh, books and, and incredible stories. And I'm looking nervously at the clock uh, because how can we possibly squeeze a conversation and a conversation with an audience, but we'll, we'll try. So let me, let me go back to some of the 
some of the things that came out in in what what you shared with us, and and I'm fortunate because I read uh, Susan's manuscript and Bernice's book, uh, but um, but this is not the case of everybody in the audience. So let me go back to what was the theme of the of the series: this intimate relationship between between um, authors, scholars taking on uh, family histories. And, and I want to push you a little bit on it. Uh, both, um, and Bernice, you mentioned it, that you both take very different approaches. In your book, your personal relationship with a story is not uh, clear at all. Uh, you're you're very absent in a way from 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 the story of your of your mother, um, and then in Susan's book, you are present. You are in the pictures. You're you're there as a child. You're there as a, an adolescent with your dreams, with family, uh, intimate family moments. So, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about this choice. Uh, and the experience of researching something that is both researchable, you both came up with incredible documents, you visited places, you visited archives, um, but also something so close. Um, so maybe Bernice, if you, if you would like to start. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so you were right, Natalia, you nailed it when you said that Susan and I took really opposite approaches and um, but it's, it's kind of interesting. We also had sort of opposite kinds of experiences where Susan had detective work from practically like a blank slate and she had to find out everything. Whereas my, my parents talked and I could, I could really ask any question anytime I wanted. I could have these really informal conversations with my mom like, oh, what did you buy in Bloomingdale's? Oh, so... Um, what did you, what were you wearing on the death march? You know, like I, I wasn't that abrupt, I wasn't that like stark, but it was this fluid thing where, you know, after a while she knew I had the uh, scaffold of her story and things that reminded each of us of things we could share and I could ask her anything. So it's a, kind of interesting that uh, we had this sort of really intimate relationship and where I was, I'm always, I'm still very, very close with my mom. And we talk about anything and everything almost at any time. But I decided for the purpose of the writing her story to completely remove myself from the narrative. So I just, and I found that that was, once I made that decision that really helped me because I tried to write things over the years and I'm just not, wasn't very good about writing about myself in the picture and that, and that, didn't really interest me so much, but I tried to sort of separate myself and say, okay, forget that she's my mom. Like, you know, whatever is going on with us, whatever. Here's this little girl. What was it like for this little girl to go through these experiences? What was her childhood like? What did it mean that she had a hard scrabble childhood? And how did those biological endowments and experiences help her through, through the worst of times? So I kind of try to take a step back and look at her story that way. And now I'm working on one of my father too. But that was my next question because yes. you are second generation on both sides. Yes. Um, yes, but um, yeah, I think all these accounts are so fascinating. And I think, but I think that there is some similarities in both Susan and my experiences of digging into the archives because um, yeah, we're coming up with similar sorts of things. And it was so interesting, Susan, to see your slides because my mom also drew a map of her hometown, same kind of sketch as your dad. So I'm gonna include that in my PowerPoint presentation <laughs> from now. Anyway. And you, man, you, you went there before, before the pandemic, right? You did yes. go to Siget. Yes. And did, was the map accurate the way that Susan's map? Well, yeah, not well. She filled in a lot of details. I think the whole alley, the way that she, the whole plot of land she's describing was raised completely. But yeah, I mean, the mountains don't move. The place where her school was didn't move. The synagogue didn't move. So certain things were that she described to me. It was really interesting to see. Of course, it's very changed now. Susan, if you can. 
yeah, talk I, about your relationship. I, I sometimes wonder if I would have been as interested if I'd had, had a different kind of upbringing because we were in a Christian suburb of Phoenix. I didn't know other people with a name like Jacobowitz. And um, I didn't know other people who had parents who were survivors. And also my mother was not a survivor. So my father's idea, part of his idea about putting it in the past and also having the best possible you know, outcome for his children was you know, to not marry a survivor, to not live in a Jewish, uh, close to a large Jewish community. He told me later that he felt that, that people couldn't help it. Whenever they were together, they would talk about it because they couldn't help it. And he didn't want to talk about it. So in a way we were kind of living, you know, under a kind of cover, but not like, not in the same way as some of the people who I've written about, who I've studied, who, uh, you know, like Madeleine Albright, who were raised Catholic and really didn't know that their grandparents had died in Auschwitz and things like that. So it was interesting, but when I went on the trip with my, when my father brought me suddenly impetuously along with him on this trip with his cousins, they all, and he explained why I was there. They all thought it was kind of funny that I wanted to know something about their lives. They're like, we want to talk about it with our kids and they don't want to hear. So I wonder like if I had grown up in Israel or if my father had been somebody who had wanted to talk to me about it all the time, or even if I had been closer to my father, if it would have been so important to me, but somehow it was because I felt that we weren't close. I had some of the classic second generation difficulties of feeling that I wasn't enough of a compensation to my father for what he had suffered. And that made me, you know, feel badly about myself. And I just, you know, I just felt this strong compul compulsion to know, but, but I never thought about taking my, you know, removing myself from the story. I'm also a writer and, and in my own writing, I focus on literary nonfiction. And I think that that was the really compelling story for me. The story was the story of our own family. This, you know, it's, it's sort of the story of yourself that you really want to know. I thought it was also interesting how the two of you made uh, different choices with presenting this immense research. I mean, in a, in a very uh, uh, material way, Bernice has footnotes and, and all these documents um, placed in, in the archival references. And, and Susan, you have, you have a bibliography, but then the flow of the story uh, doesn't stop to show you the proof for this finding or that finding, which I thought was an interesting way of relating to this detective uh, uh, work, the investigation that you did do. But I, I wanted to ask something about the material aspect of this research. Again, following up on, on, on your um, uh, writing these projects, uh, you both talk about, Bernice, you mentioned that you don't have family pictures or your mother pictures before that, uh, picture with said eyes taken in in Sweden and 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 Susan you talk about your father's pictures I think the same age I mean they're also born both in 1929 um, so I wonder that were there closets when you were growing up with documents uh, with material uh, remnants of things or was it stories or lack thereof? How did it play out in your um, attachment to reconstructing what happened? So um, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, Susan's dad and my mom were roughly the same age. So they, um, they were teenagers and teenagers uh, who survived had some, a lot of them had some kind of resilience. They had this childhood or this past that could anchor them. If they had, most of them had a solid family growing up. And then they had this whole future that stretched out ahead of them that they could, they had, they could begin their life. Uh, they're teenagers. They hadn't married or lost children or so. Um, but um, Susan's dad came to the United States early as an orphan and was had some schooling. And um, that was a really a very wonderful thing. My mom was uh, had a different story because she was so sick. She was she nearly died. So she was in and out of TB sanatoriums, she would say for her whole um, teenage years from the age of 15 to 25, she was spent more time probably recuperating than out in the world. 
but it um, but for both of our parents, they had a chance to sort of come to their own before they had children. The majority of survivors were in their 20s and 30s. A lot of them got married immediately post-war and had children, had children right away. So whatever decision, it sounds like Susan's father made a really conscious decision to really put his past behind him. My mom um, made a conscious decision to marry another survivor. She was in Sweden. The guy, the men she dated were mostly Swedes, not Jewish, but she just something in the back of her mind wanted her very much to, you know, marry someone Jewish. And then it was just a, for, in her case, it turned out to be a lucky thing that she married someone from a very similar background because that didn't happen a lot after the war either. So my parents are both from the Carpathian Mountain region and um, they're both survivors. And I think my father would probably, he probably would not have been happy married to an American woman. It would have, I mean, he might've been, it might've been, a, you know, who knows, but I think they had this common language they would lapse into all the time like just throwing in Yiddish words or Hungarian words or remember this from the past, help me explain this. So it was kind of this unified parental presence in the house. They had this similar kind of experience. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I was curious if, if there was a material, oh, material remnant. Things. The material um, things. So my mom had a lot of things from Sweden, right? She had her own dowry that she masked, amassed like aura for his crystal. And she also had papers and she also had some schooling and she had some records. So, but that's it. Like nothing from before the war. Yes, I went so to the So that was the censura. Yeah, yeah. The, but I do have some of the papers that Susan was showing from the records of Bad Arlson of her like being in a labor camp, but not, no photos, nothing from before. Yeah, I, I, I think that direction that Bernice went into, it really fascinates me because I think that's, I see that as the next step. I've become so interested in the, in the US Committee for the Care of European Children and the people who were involved in that. And also the people who were working for UNRWA and how there was this whole system set up to try to deal with such a gigantic humanitarian crisis and how those things play out so powerfully just in individual lives. I mean, what would have happened to my dad? He was stateless, he had no money and he had no one to sponsor him, you know? So what would, it, you know, the DP camps didn't close in Europe. I think the last one, it was 1957. So some people were just kind of left there. And then what you're saying also about that they had their whole lives before them, that's how my father explained it to me. I've only ever used him, heard him use the word Nazi once. And I think he was using it to refer to a Republican. It was something political. It wasn't about actual Nazis. And he apologized afterwards saying it's because they don't care about people. And he never even talked about it or, or used the word, or I've only heard him mention the word Auschwitz once, you know, because he said, because the way that he thought about it was that they had had that part of his life and there was nothing that he could do about that. But then everything after that, would be his, it would be up to him to decide what it would be and to make it what it was going to be. So he just, he wanted that clean break. And that's why he didn't go try to get any kind of reparation after that first initial attempt. It was such a painful experience for him. It was $400 and he had to give part of it to an attorney. He said that the thought of getting something in the mail every month that would be from the German government with a check would have been so disturbing to him as a reminder of what he had survived that he didn't want to do it. But then a few years ago, he said, maybe if there had been direct deposit, he would have done it. <laughs> uh, so I want to follow up um, um, on something that Bernice, you said when you, when you started talking about your mother. And I keep on thinking how uh, Glenn, it's interesting because you we wave Glenn uh, Hughes, who is not a family member. He's an important historical figure. And you really gave him his first um, biography um, uh, in your book. Uh, and, and Susan Wave's entire family universe. Um, and so they're very intricate books, but in very different ways. But I want to touch on the, the, that interrupted childhood uh, uh, between how uh, Bernice, your book starts with the beginning of the end of your mother's childhood. Um, I, I believe that's that's the wording. And Susan, uh, even the title, um, "Far from Childhood." And what were what, what what did you think writing your parents, 
your mother, your father's interrupted childhoods that sort of abruptly ended. Um, you're yourself as parents and as authors. Go ahead, Bernice. Well, you know, the process in the process of writing, I think I learned more and I came to a greater understanding. I didn't realize how difficult my mother had it. For uh, She came from a very poor family. They didn't know they were poor, but um, she had to work really hard. She was the second of six children. She worked in her grandmother's poultry business. She was, she came to Auschwitz with the black book of everybody who owed them money to, you know, in her pocket, she was really working and taking care of her younger siblings. And I think she was very unspoiled. I realized like how unspoiled she is, like even to this day, like, you know, if I were to take her someplace, I don't know, I took her to on a cruise and I took, if I were to take my kids, my kids are much more jaded. They grew up with a lot of stuff everything from my mother. She just appreciates every little thing, everything she's seeing, everything. So um, there's a really nice quality to that and to someone who really worked hard for everything she has. And I just admired her abilities and her, her really her street smarts in a way. Um, when she was came to Auschwitz, she had never slept away from her home before. And here she was in this place. So I, um, and, but just how she sort of acclimated and sort of the choices she made as a kid and how she responded to people in the camp and how she worked for a Nazi officer. And yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah, I, I viewed her, her childhood is, was sort of sacred. It's this sort of sacred little chapter to me that really fortified her for what was to come. And we talked about it a lot. We, uh, and she would, use the word Nazi, she would use the word capo. If she came across somebody who was really mean, she would say, oh, that person would have been a good capo or something. It was part of our, what we would reference. It was in the air. So it's kind of fascinating to me how Susan's dad kind of separated himself out and he, he wanted nothing to do with his past, so. Yeah, I, I think that retaining that simplicity and the simple appreciation for things, I have really loved that about my dad too. He'll be telling me a story about how, you know, he was in the DP camp and somebody got a box of food and he ate the most delicious, incredible thing. They still remember to this day. And it turns out it's a saltine cracker, you know? So it's like, it's like that. I think just like, you know, the things that they value are, are really the thing, very simple things, nothing commercial, nothing materialistic. He still lives very simply. I think only people really matter in that way. So those kinds of things, yes. But I think I came to understand that my father didn't really have much of a childhood. It wasn't a happy home. His father struggled. His parents' marriage was not happy. He tried to help his mother. His older sister ran away. She's sort of the sort of typical story of not wanting to be the second mother to a bunch of kids. So my dad actually helped take care of his four younger brothers and sisters. He was very comfortable with babies. And I think that's part of what happened in our family is I think he was very comfortable with us when we were babies and very hands-on. He knew how to take care of babies better than my mother did who was the youngest of five and didn't really know how to take care of a baby. But I think when it came to children or when it came to being able to sort of meet us in the world where we lived, that was just so different from anything he had ever experienced. He was kind of absent or he didn't know how to make that connection. So he focused so much of his energy on being a good breadwinner, on providing for us, you know? But it was just somehow there was, it was, he was such a remote figure and such a stoic figure that I think I just had a hard time maybe, you know, feeling that connection between us um, that, that grew much more as I learned more about his story because the same way that Art Spiegelman, when he was asked once about whether or not working on his project brought him closer to his father, made the relationship with his father better. He said, you don't seem to understand it was the relationship. You know, so for a while, this sort of was my relationship with my father, I think was trying to understand what he was telling me and trying to incorporate it into, you know, what I was working on. Did your parents, mother, father, did they read the manuscripts? Of your In my case, my mom read every draft, every draft. In fact, I remember sitting in the airport with her. We were coming back from some 
some family event or something. And I showed her the draft of a chapter that was about her childhood. And it was, oh, she had like, she was tearing up and it was, you know, so sad. We second generation don't like to see our parents get sad. It's why so many of us don't ask questions. And it, it was very sad, but in a way that's how I knew I nailed it because it, yeah. Did she request things to be put in or taken out? No, she was very, again, you know, sort of like this simple appreciation of everything. Um, just even after it got published, there was a few minor things that she said, oh, maybe I should have corrected that, but I didn't want to bother you with it. <laughs> More work for you. I didn't want to make work for you. I don't want to, I don't want you to stress. I don't want you, but she read, she read every word of the manuscript and she learned a lot. She learned about the medical rescue uh, that took she place. She didn't in know. Yeah. So. Susan? I, I think my dad will be surprised by some of the research I was able to find too. But when he first agreed to tell me his story, he, the two conditions he said were that we never talk about it again and that I never ask him to read anything that I write. I, when I did my MFA, uh, it was my MFA thesis, and um, it ended up winning a, an award. There was a press conference, and I had to do a reading, and my father wanted to come. So he did hear that short reading um, uh, then. And my daughter, my older daughter at that time was five, and she said that he was crying, you know, while I was doing the reading. But now I think it's changed a little bit. He knows how, um, how, what a large project it is for me. And he said to me recently that he does want to read it, but he wants to read it, you know, when everybody can read it, like he's going to read it. Because I think he doesn't want me to feel that pressure of going through the manuscript and maybe, you know, why, why is this here? Why is that there? And that kind of thing. So that, that would be, you know, that, that felt very supportive. He's very conflicted because he, I think he just wanted to feel like, we we didn't feel like we had to do these. We had to be involved with that past, you know. So when I first got the fellowship and was able to take last year to do the research, he was so excited for me that I got the fellowship. But he said, you know, if you want to do something else, if you want to research something else, that would be fine with me too. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing what you've shared, and in, I encourage all of you to. Um, to get um, uh, after the program, to get your hands or, on Bernice's book and to wait uh, um, impatiently for Susan's. And, uh, and now we have a few minutes for questions. So Julie, if you would be so kind to, um, sure. to sh share them with us. Of course. Um, well, the first question I can answer, um, as I mentioned during the intro, we, we will be recording this and it will be posted on our website and our YouTube channel um, within a couple of weeks. And we will also be emailing everybody who registered uh, a link to the video as soon as it's available. So you can look for that. Somebody had asked about that. And I also wanted to mention that um, I did include a link to a 30% uh, discount off Bernice's book in the um, confirmation that you received today. And we'll also include that link again uh, when we send the video. Okay, on to more important questions. Uh, this question is for Bernice. Um, in which other camps was your mother before Bergen-Belsen? She was deported to Auschwitz and um, she miraculously, she would say miraculously, was um, taken out of Auschwitz and taken to a labor camp called Christianstadt and then a death march and then Bergen-Belsen. Um, and this one is for Susan. Um, what is the name of the place in Israel where you found that last document from your town in Hungary? Oh, it's a, it's, the series is called Names, Names or Nevek, N-E-V-E-K. And it's a nine volume series from the Beata Tharsfeld Foundation. And they reconstructed the communities based on civic records, tax records, things like that. Yeah, it's very helpful. Um, and then there's one more quick question for you here that'll just take a second. Um, somebody asks, who was it that paid your father compensation? Um, what organization was it that where he got that actual payment of four hundred dollars? That was coming from the German government. It was in, it was 1960, and they were just starting, I think, to you know to open up compensation. Um, I think it had started earlier in Israel, 
And um, so uh, his cousins, he had some cousins in Los Angeles who told him about it. And he, you know, he started that process. Okay, thanks. Um, and this one is for Bernice. Um, assuming you started to write about your mother and that she did not personally know the British soldier, how did you decide to include him in such a prominent way? Did it help provide a structure to include so much context to her experience? Yeah, so truth be told, I, I wasn't gonna write about my mother. I was gonna write about Glenn Hughes. I discovered Glenn Hughes and I thought, oh my goodness, here's this amazing character who was totally went against British officialdom, was really supportive of the survivors, was, had really moral intentions when he came on into this camp. First thing he said, he wanted to save as many lives as possible. Who was he? I, I tried to find out more about him. I traveled to England. I met with his daughter. I spoke with his son. I met with his friends who were still alive. And I spoke to survivors who knew him. And I spoke to Ellie Wiesel, who everyone thought he was worthy, a real uh, character who was really worth a biography. And I set out to write about Glenn Hughes, thinking he was should be as well known as an Oscar Schindler, both for his, his life before, during, and after the war. And then people were asking me about my mom. So I, I decided, all right, I'm going to try to see if I could tell both their stories as sort of this race against time rescue story. And that's what I did. Uh, one, one last question. Um, thank you all for the import, very important conversation and the important work. A question for Susan. Can you share more about the experience of hearing your father's story for the first time, this one-time event for you to listen as both daughter and historian? What was happening for your father during those hours and days? We were taking this trip together with his cousins and we had never spent that kind of time together. It was very intimate. We were, um, I think originally my mother would have taken that trip with him, but my parents separated and divorced around that time. So, um, I was sleeping next to him on the bed and we were just together all the time. And also my dad had to translate because his cousins, I, they were very willing to talk to me, but we didn't have a common language. So they, would, they were speaking Yiddish and my father would translate. I realized then in those translated conversations that they didn't know each other's stories, just like my mother didn't know my father's story. He had really never told anybody. And so we started a little odyssey in rental cars where I was driving my father and then his cousins were in the other car. And in this car, we started talking. And at some point he, he broke down and he started to cry actually. And I was very shocked. I'd never seen my father cry before really. And um, was going to pull over and he said, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. But he, but you know, that's, that's when he started to tell me some of these things. And it, it is really difficult because particularly with my father, like even speaking here, it's a little bit difficult. I feel like he just didn't want to be reminded of it. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to think about it. And that was the one thing that I was sort of always asking him to do. And so I felt like I was maybe outing him or I was maybe taking advantage of a really tragic past for my own work. And so it has been really difficult and it's been really complicated. And I think that's one reason why it's taken maybe so many years. I mean, part of it is that borders weren't open and archives were closed and it takes time to do the research and the writing. And I was, I'm an academic and I was raising a family as well. But I think some of it is just that it's very difficult. You know, if it's something your parents don't want to talk about, that it's something you insist that they talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody asked if you could repeat the name of the organization in Israel for names, because they couldn't hear you. <laughs> yeah. um. <laughs> I should put it in the chat. Um, it comes from the Yada Klarsfeld Foundation. And so you, they've done a lot of work like this and it's called Names. And in Hungarian, I think it's Hungarian, it's N-E-V-E-K, Nebek, something like that. So it's a series of nine volumes and it focuses on the that Carpathian area, just the areas of the Hungarian deportations that started in 1944. Okay. Right. Which, well, is, which is yet another um, way in which your stories converge. Um, it's very remarkable. Uh, Julie, you were saying. I was just going to say that we, um, I think it's time for us to wrap it up. And um, I just want to thank all three of you. This was a really fascinating conversation and I can't wait to read both of your books. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you, Julie. Okay.
And thank you to all our participants.